On December 13, 1993, a lone prospector entered the darkest jungles of Borneo and discovered the biggest gold strike of the 20th century. These series of jungle hills in Indonesia, um, which all had been formed by a volcano, were lying on top of a pool of gold. The prospector staked a claim on behalf of a small mining company named Briax. He ordered rock samples drilled and sent for testing. There was some interesting core results, and it seemed like this could be one of those junior plays that made people a lot of money. Independent auditors assessed the size of the gold deposit as astronomical. And they started to realize that they had what they thought was an elephant deposit, a great big puddle of gold. Briex stock took off like a rocket. The prospector used the money to expand his operation. He cleared hundreds of acres of jungle and brought in sophisticated excavation machinery. The analysts on Bay Street and Wall Street got caught up in the excitement. And every time they published more details about this gold find in Indonesia, the market capitalization of the company, the size of the company, would jump. This company went from a dollar or two dollars to $286. This was the largest gold deposit in the world. Back in Indonesia, the prospector kept uncovering more and more gold. Gold is trading at $350 US an ounce. If you multiply it out, it's about $70 billion US. Fueled by greed, everyone from boardroom executives to middle-class suburbanites wanted in on the action. Everybody wanted to be the suitor to uh, walk down the aisle with Briex. Even the corrupt Indonesian government tried to muscle in. But what no one knew was, there was no gold, not one ounce. The lone prospector cashed in his company stock options and made off with millions, leaving investors devastated. People who have basically put a lot of their life savings into Briex lose everything. And I know of several individuals who committed suicide. The prospector had engineered an unparalleled gold rush outsmarting scientists, analysts, and investors. His name was Michael de Guzman. The question is, how did he do it? Michael de Guzman has convinced the world to invest in a gold mine that isn't there, turning a penny stock into a billion dollar venture and lining his pockets with millions. Michael de Guzman was uh, a Filipino um, geologists who worked in Indonesia. For years, de Guzman struggles for recognition in an industry dominated by large American mining companies. Mike de Guzman knew he was smart, he had fabulous marks, he had an engineering degree, but he never got a great job, he never got a crack at a, at a great job. It's very difficult for the Filipinos, even with uh, extremely good engineering training, to get senior jobs with the big mining companies. While exploring the jungles of Borneo, De Guzman devises a plan to make himself rich. Unable to get the support he needs to find a gold mine, he decides to invent one. Michael De Guzman was going to get the wealth that he could never aspire to otherwise. De Guzman reasons that the most convincing site for the world's largest gold mine is on the Indonesian island of Borneo. In the area around Indonesia is an area which is quite unusually rich in gold. Gold mines are associated with um, volcanic activity quite a bit, so areas where you get volcanoes, you will find gold mines. De Guzman concocts a geological theory to capitalize on what the experts already believe. And the theory essentially was where there are extinct volcanoes, you're going to kind of have a plug of uh, minerals like gold that are fairly close to the surface. Now De Guzman must find someone with credibility to sell his idea to the world. He targets geologist John Felderhoff. John Felderhoff is uh, the very sort of person you would imagine that would be crazy enough to go through the jungles of Kalimantan or Borneo uh, wearing hip waders and looking for gold. He had actually a well-established reputation of having discovered a gold mine in Indonesia. De Guzman convinces Felderhoff to find a foreign investor who's willing to take risks and not ask questions. Felderhoff recommends a businessman from Western Canada. 
David Walsh was this promoter. He'd been bankrupt. He'd been sort of living out of the trunk of his car. He was the kind of guy who was always talking up a story. Walsh has flown to Indonesia, where he's wined and dined in the finest hotel in Jakarta. Walsh was at a point where he was looking for some promising properties, and he spent basically his last few bucks to take a trip to Indonesia. With nothing more than a few rocks, maps, and some questionable data, de Guzman sells Walsh on investing 80 grand on a property in Borneo that he's never even seen. It's called Busang. The thing that made the Briex fraud credible in everybody's eyes was that one of the largest gold mines in the world is in the Indonesian islands, about 70 miles away from what became Busang. In exchange for their work exploring Busang, de Guzman demands stock options for himself and Felderhoff. Now de Guzman sets out to turn this penny stock company into a corporation worth billions. He starts by hiring a young Filipino staff, over which he has total control. Well, the person really in charge on site in Busang was Michael de Guzman. De Guzman orders his team to drill core samples. Once extracted, the core sample is split in two. Typically, half is stored on site. The other half is then crushed and sent to a lab to be tested determining how much gold is present. But because de Guzman knows the property has no gold, he employs an age-old mining trick called salting. Salting refers to adding gold to the ore. Usually what would happen is you'd have a gold mine and you'd go there and you'd take the gold nuggets, sprinkle it around the way you'd sprinkle salt around. De Guzman orders the crushed rock moved to a locked shed where he's sure to have absolute privacy. Inside, he devises an ingenious method of salting the samples with gold filed from his wedding ring. Adding it to the ground up rock. As far as I know, that's not been done before. That was quite a, that was a novel twist. The challenge to Michael is then taking 40 pounds of rock figuring out exactly how many gold flakes should go in there. In other words, there's three ounces of gold per ton of rock. So he's got to do a fair amount of division and he's got to carefully weigh out his gold. If he'd grabbed uh, a teaspoonful and chucked it in, the gold grade would have been phenomenal. He would have gone, <laughs> uh, and it would have attracted attention. De Guzman's calculations are perfect. The lab results suggest high levels of gold without raising suspicion. De Guzman has his frontman, John Felderhoff, call David Walsh at his home in Western Canada and tell him the good news. The lab results are the equivalent of a hot tip. The market came to really look forward to these results. You know, there'd be a big excitement. Walsh would say, on Tuesday, we should have co you know, core results for you. Tuesday would come, sure enough, there'd be 10 or 12 new holes. As each consecutive lab result is posted, it appears that more and more gold is being found in Busang. Investors rush to buy Briex shares listed on the Alberta Stock Exchange in Canada. There's so much drilling at Busang that de Guzman needs a larger supply of gold in order to keep salting the thousands of samples. There's a lot of local Indonesian natives who make their living, or at least a part of their living, by panning for gold in the rivers. Michael befriended this fellow uh, and started buying gold off him. So over a period of about two years, Michael bought about $61,000 worth of gold off this guy. Meanwhile, investors anxious to get in on the deal send over an independent auditor to review all de Guzman's records. The auditor demands to see de Guzman's core samples. But de Guzman hasn't saved half the samples. They did split their core all right, but uh, they only kept uh, 10 centimeters out of every meter. That's very unusual. To prevent the auditor from becoming suspicious, de Guzman is ready with an explanation. He cites a phenomenon called the nugget effect, in which the gold is distributed unevenly. De Guzman insists he must crush all of the sample in order to get an accurate reading. The key 
key was crushing up all the core. Nobody could check. Right. Having crushed up all the core, basically they destroyed the evidence. But when the auditor takes a closer look at the samples, he's suspicious about the river gold purchased by de Guzman. The gold you get from panning in a river looks quite different from the gold that you find at the bottom of the gold mine. River gold gets rounded around the edges. The flakes of gold are shaped by the forces of the water and the weather. De Guzman uses his theory of volcanic pools to explain why this kind of gold is precisely what you would expect at Busang. Within hours, the Briex website announces the successful audit and the stock rises dramatically. You can watch this stock move. It would go from $20 to $30 in the space of three weeks. Building on his success with the auditor, de Guzman now moves to drive the stock price even higher. They looked at their maps and they said, okay, well, if there's gold here, maybe there'll be gold over here as well. And that's when they got into Busang too. De Guzman finds enough surface gold to convince David Walsh to finance drilling for what he claims is a second massive gold deposit. Once again, de Guzman has Felderhoff fire off a message to David Walsh. We've got a monster by the tail. Walsh pounces on it. He applies for Briex to be listed on the NASDAQ and the Toronto Stock Exchange. Wall Street and investors elsewhere and analysts elsewhere were totally on side, were totally enthusiastic, were totally uh, hypnotized by the rising stock price, by the rising claims of Briex. Now de Guzman makes his boldest claim. Based on drilling results from Busang 2, he declares that Briex has the largest gold deposit in the world. The investors just looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. Having built Briex into a company worth $6 billion, and with its stock price at nearly $300 a share, it's time for de Guzman to start cashing in. He and his team sell enough shares to be rewarded with over $100 million. When Felderhoff and when Walsh and when de Guzman started selling a part of their holdings, but not all of it, people just figured, well, that's just guys who've had a tough run all their lives, and they're just taking out some insurance. De Guzman is now worth millions. But what he doesn't know is the Indonesian government is about to make a move that threatens to reveal his scam. Michael de Guzman has pulled off the biggest fraud in mining history. He's fooled the world's leading investors, turned a penny stock into a billion dollar venture, and lined his pockets with millions. But he's now facing a real crisis. The beginning of the end for Briex uh, was a problem in Indonesia. The Indonesian government, which is hideously corrupt, decides to challenge Briex's claim to this fabulous deposit. In August of 1996, the Indonesian government revokes Briex's exploration permit and opens the property to other mining companies. The government itself was going to get very much involved in the ownership of the deposit and they were going to invite who they wanted to see to develop the deposit. So what you saw unfold in rather ugly fashion between uh, the summer of 1996 and the spring of 1997 was this uh, fight amongst major companies for a piece of the action. Michael de Guzman knows his drilling records will soon come under scrutiny from the other mining companies, a move that's sure to reveal the Briex fraud. Desperate, he destroys all his records at Busang, claiming it was an accidental fire. What went up in smoke that day would ultimately help cover the trail of the conspirators that did this wrong. The Indonesian government forces Briex to accept a new mining partner, Freeport McMoran. From now on, Briex owns only 45% of Busang. When news gets out, Briex stock drops $1 billion, but de Guzman counters. He releases new drilling results that dramatically increase the estimated gold reserves underground. 
they had previously said that they had 57 million reserves, and they increased that to slightly over 70 million reserves, given that the ownership that they had in percentage went down. To make the value be the same, they had to increase the reserves. Briex stock rises again. Shareholders are thrilled. In the spring of 1997, De Guzman and his team are invited to be guests of honor at Briex's annual shareholder meeting in Toronto, Canada. Michael De Guzman made a presentation as part of the Briex annual meeting to talk about what he found, to talk about what the different real results had proven that was underneath the ground. He was able to stand before shareholders with this fabulously expensive stock. A company that's worth $5 billion and said, look, we did the best deal we could under the circumstances. We're all rich. Isn't this great? He was wildly applauded, considered a hero. His uh, theories of mining, even though they were slightly unusual, seemed to be validated by the results. But on the other side of the world, Briex's new partner is anxiously drilling for gold, only yards away from where de Guzman had drilled and their samples came up empty. They weren't finding the gold that Michael de Guzman had said was there. De Guzman got the phone call. We don't seem to find any of the gold you say is there. Get your story behind, back to Indonesia pronto, pal, and explain this to us. After three years and billions of dollars, time is running out for the mastermind behind the world's largest fraud. When Briex's powerful new partner doesn't find gold at Busang, Michael de Guzman is forced back to Indonesia. The next morning, he climbs into the back of a helicopter driven by an uh, Indonesian Air Force officer, takes off over the jungle. He's about 400 or 500 feet in the air over some of the deepest rainforest in all of Indonesia. And the pilot looked into the back seat, and de Guzman was gone. De Guzman had jumped out of the helicopter, apparently, Three days later, the Indonesian army claims to find de Guzman's body. It's badly decomposed and partially eaten by animals. It's so gruesome, the authorities won't let his family view the remains. It was very difficult uh, to believe that uh, they took two, three days, I recall, to find the body when, in fact, the pilot did, said he did set the GPS uh, recorder, so they should have been able to find the spot. Rumors swirl about de Guzman's death. Was it suicide, murder, or yet another perfectly planned deception? If you wanted to disappear anywhere on this planet, Indonesia would be one of the easier places to do it, that you could, for a few hundred dollars, purchase a recently deceased body. Independent drilling takes place directly beside where de Guzman took thousands of samples, and not a single ounce of gold is found. They go and they drill their own core samples, and the security they have around that is unmatched. They are drilling two or three feet away from where Briaxis says there's tons of gold. All they find is rock flake. There is no gold there. It looks so good, it couldn't be real. I mean, it's too good to be real. It's an unbelievable revelation. They just can't believe that this fabulous deposit, in fact, never existed. Investors around the world suddenly realize they've been hacked. Walsh is just flabbergasted. He cannot believe that this is happening. And it's that point that the Briex team in Toronto realizes that they've got nothing to go on, that their, that their stock is going to zero because this was a massive fraud. The shares themselves are only useful as wallpaper. David Walsh adamantly denies any knowledge of the fraud. He moves to the Bahamas with his wife. Two years later, he dies of a massive heart attack. John Felderhoff continues to live in a gorgeous home right next to the Yacht Club in the Cayman Islands where there's no tax and there's also no extradition treaty with Canada for white collar crimes. Michael de Guzman, the mastermind behind the greatest mining scam of all time, is supposedly laid to rest. I compare him to Rumpelstiltskin. He was able to turn a very small amount of gold into a huge amount. He spun a story into a huge amount of gold. No criminal charges have arisen uh, out of the Briex scandal. Uh, no one has ever spent a day in jail as a result of it. The fraud itself has changed the way that Canadian regulators look at the mining industry. It would be 
somewhat more difficult to pull off a similar type of scam, but it, it, it isn't impossible. It probably still could be done again. The adage, caveat emptor, is indeed true. Buyer beware. In spite of class action lawsuits, not one investor has ever been compensated. A harsh reality for thousands of ordinary people who invested their life savings in Briex and were left penniless. I actually believe that Michael de Guzman is alive. I don't think that he did fall out of that helicopter. I believe that he faked his own death and that he's enjoying the money that he scammed at Briex.